introduce the panel, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Ambassador Julia Chang Block, who will introduce this panel on public diplomacy perspectives across the region. Is it on now? I said I would begin this panel with some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that we lost one of our panelists. Our speaker from the Indian Embassy uh, has been felled by the flu, so he cannot be with us. Uh, the good news is that that'll give those of us left more time to talk. <laughs> and also for more of you to join in the conversation and ask questions. So now, uh, let me begin by saying that as the f founding president of the US-China Education Trust, let me thank Global Ties for all you do for international education and exchange, and for bringing us together today. It is my pleasure to serve as moderator for this panel this morning, as it is very, very timely that Global Times, or rather Global, global Ties, strategic dialogue this year is looking east. Am I pointing east? Anyway, we are looking east. Until recently, Research and discourse on public diplomacy has been dominated by the American experience. During the Cold War, public diplomacy was a central part of American foreign policy strategy to win hearts and minds and persuade foreign publics of the attractions of the American way of life, as well as the rightness of our policies. Since the Cold War, public diplomacy's relevance and priority in US foreign policy, I'm unhappy to say, has declined, manifested particularly by budget cuts and the absorption of the US information agency, USIA, by the State Department. Even 9-11, could not reverse this trend. Although public diplomacy aimed at the Middle East as part of the anti-terrorism campaign gained some funding. The fact that the post 9-11 US public diplomacy aims in the Arab world have seen less than success leads us to the importance of this particular panel today. We need to learn from others, like from Australia and from Japan, to see what countries in the most dynamic and fast rising region in the world, what they're doing. We have three panel, oh, two panelists today, <laughs> who will help us understand public diplomacy in the Asian context. What are the distinct public diplomacy strategies of Asian countries? And how is public diplomacy being used to meet the challenges in the region? Let me very briefly, in the interest of time, introduce our two speakers. To my right is Ambassador Katrina Cooper, Deputy Chief of Mission from the Embassy of Australia. To my left is Mr. Takahiro Shimada, Minister Counselor for Communications and Cultural Affairs from the Embassy of Japan. Uh, Ambassador Cooper will begin. Thank you very much, Ambassador. 
Uh, and thank you, uh, thank you very much to Global Ties uh, for uh, this event and for the kind invitation. Um, I was very pleased to come and um, speak uh, today on the panel for three reasons. Um, the first reason is that I was an AFS exchange student after high school to Ecuador and that very much changed um, the trajectory of, of my life and my career. Um, I went to Ecuador, I spent one year there as an exchange student and I think if it hadn't been for that experience, my first posting would not have been to Chile and I would not have been the ambassador to Mexico. So I think that was a very formative and important year for me. The second is um, uh, the topic, of course, of today, Look East. Uh, Australia is in the heart of the Indo-Pacific uh, region and uh, I think it's very important uh, for ongoing discussion with the United States and other partners about our joint efforts in the region. Uh, the third reason which is related to that is that late last year uh, the Australian government released what we call a white paper on foreign policy, which is broader than foreign policy, it's foreign and security policy, but it talks very much um, about our objectives and goals over the next decade and very much has uh, sustained US engagement in the Indo-Pacific region as one of those goals. And I think public diplomacy is a really important element of international engagement. Um, I thought I might um, just begin uh, before going into what we're doing on our people to people links is perhaps just make some overview comments and then I can draw, we can draw out any of those uh, specific issues that I touch on. Uh, I thought it might just be useful to talk about uh, what we mean when we say public diplomacy, because I think it means different things to different people in different countries. We think very much of public diplomacy as a subset, if you like, of soft power. Uh, and we think of public diplomacy as being the overt and transparent arm of uh, uh, influencing. So it's about making friends and influencing people. So people to people links are very much an important part of that. Um, not all soft power is that overt, some of it is uh, more hidden. So what I'm going to be talking about today is very much about our people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, and, and when we talk about that in Australia, about public diplomacy, we are talking increasingly about building networks and influencing international agendas and building relationships, which is interesting, I think, in a, when you reflect on our global... Uh, environment today where we're seeing more and more digital exchanges, that that emphasis coming back increasingly to people to people links and institution to institution links. I did want to touch on a number of our people to people programs today, which I can do in the course of our discussion. Um, the first, I think, and, and most exciting uh, one is the what we call the new Colombo plan. Um, we had uh, many years ago uh, in the mid uh, 50s, something we called the Colombo plan. Um, and through that plan, more than 20,000 students from the Indo-Pacific came to study in Australia and receive, receive tertiary education there. And it was a very popular program, and many of those people who came to Australia at that time um, are now in very influential positions in the Indo-Pacific, and we constantly come across people who were um, in Colombo Plan students. So it wasn't surprising then when our current government was elected, our foreign minister, Julie Bishop, decided to launch a new Colombo plan, which is the Colombo plan, but in reverse. So instead of Indo students from the Indo-Pacific coming to Australia, we're now sending our students from Australia out into the Pacific. So they gain a better understanding of the region in which we operate. Um, so we, we invest about $50 million a year into that program. Uh, and we have 10,000 scholarships and short-term opportunities for study in the region. Um, another program that we have is the Australia Awards, which is about scholarships to Australia. And we have about 4,000 of those scholarships, mostly from developing countries. And the vast majority of those, about 86%, come from the Indo-Pacific region. Um, we also have a very um, well-developed international student program. Um, we have 650,000 international students a year to Australia which is much less um, than the United States, but when you consider the population of Australia, which is much, <laughs> much, much smaller than the United States, that's quite a, quite a significant number of students in our universities. Uh, we also have um, special visits programs, much like the one um, that our colleague from uh, Singapore spoke of, where we identify up and coming 
uh, people from across the world and invite them to Australia for a special program. That's called our Special Visitors Program. Um, we have Australian Volunteers Program, which is sponsored uh, by the Australian Government, where we send um, about a thousand volunteers overseas. And then we have our broader public diplomacy and cultural programs that are run by each of our um, embassies overseas, as well as kind of broader international programs. So I might just leave the overview at that, but would you know very much like the opportunity as we go through today to expand a little bit more on each of those programs, depending on 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 your interest. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Takehiro Shimada. I am the uh, uh, minister in charge of uh, communication and culture of the Japanese embassy. Uh, it is my honor to be invited here, but uh, this is my first time to have, uh, you know, to uh, engage in such a, you know, the program on, to speak about uh, uh, public diplomacy in front of such a lot of uh, audience. So, but I'm a bit, bit uh, nervous, and I sometimes find the. Uh, some testimony, testimony type of a program on TV, but I'm feeling like a grill, but don't please be kind to me t this morning. <laughs> but anyway, and the, uh, I'm right, I'm right, uh, I would like to talk about our Japanese public diplomacy towards the United States, and maybe sometimes uh, I would uh, touch upon our diplomacy or possibility of the cooperation with the United States and others in terms of public diplomacy in Asia. This is my topics. And, uh, when I th think about the uh, you know, public diplomacy, I think it's a little bit difficult to define what the public diplomacy is. So I just refer to uh, the uh, uh, homepage of the uh, State Department, and <laughs> they said, I quote, the mission of American public diplomacy is to support the, uh, to support the achievement of US foreign policy goals and, and objectives advance national interests and enhance national security by informing and influencing foreign publics and by expanding, expanding and strengthening the relationship between the people and, people and the government of the United States and the citizens of the rest of the world. This is the uh, definition of the uh, state's government public diplomacy. I think that, uh, of course, a Japanese government uh, share the same type of definition. So maybe I will just, uh, you know, uh, refer to our public diplomacy policy on the basis of, the, you know, the same definition as a public diplomacy. So in terms of the uh, Japanese diplomacy, what is the ultimate goal of the, our di public diplomacy? I think. Uh, my understanding is that the most important thing is just to deepen American people's understanding on Japan as an important ally and friend of the United States in pursuing its national interest. And uh, fortunately, uh, I'm so uh, lucky that uh, I'm from Japan because Japan is sharing a common value with the United States, such as uh, democracy, rule of law, and the freedom of the, uh, and, uh, the uh, respect for the uh, uh, basic uh, human rights. So, uh, in terms of that, uh, we have uh, lots of uh, you know basic framework uh, for Japan to pursue the national interest in collaboration with the United States. But uh, in terms of the uh, public diplomacy to deepen uh, American audience understanding in Japan, I think I have three pillars. Um, one is the political aspect, polit political arena. As Japan uh, is sharing the uh, same value and, uh, uh, with the United States, and uh, also in terms of the political arena, Japan, I really wanted to uh, deepen the understanding of the American audience as Japan as an important ally based on the Japan-US Security Pact. Uh, actually, the uh, J Japan US Security Pact uh, has been uh, established almost like uh, uh, more than 70 years uh, since 1951. And, uh, you know, the, uh, just like our Singaporean uh, ambassador uh, mentioned at his speech, you know, the uh, presence, presence of the American military in Asia or engagement of the Asia is a very important aspect for Japan to secure our security uh, uh, and also as the, uh, to secure the uh, prosperity and the stability in that region. And even yesterday, the uh, Vice President Pence visited Japan to uh, have a dialogue with uh, Prime Minister Abe. And the mo most important part uh, which they reiterated is that the uh, importance of trilateral cooperation among United States, Japan, and South Korea 
to address the uh, imminent threat against North Korea. So I really, really appreciate the, uh, such a clear engagement of the American part uh, to secure the security of that region. Without the uh, Japan-US Security Pact, we cannot uh, afford to such a, you know, uh, uh, stability in that region. So that is one, one point. And the second point is the economic aspect, like economic arena. Uh, Japan is a kind of a very important partner with the United States uh, because uh, we uh, actually the, uh, 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 invested a lot to the United States and created the jobs. Uh, of course, we uh, you know, went through the, some difficult times when we have some trade frictions, but uh, now that the economic structure has completely changed, in which Japanese companies uh, invest to the United States and establish a production basis and uh, you know, the, uh, contribute to the consumer's needs. And for example, uh, Japan's accumulated US foreign direct investment uh, is uh, almost like uh, uh, $400 billion, and which, is, uh, on, uh, which is second only to the UK's $484 billion. And also, uh, Japanese auto industry alone uh, created the uh, 1.5 million uh, American jobs in, here in the States. So uh, as such, uh, you know, uh, you know US-Japan economic relations is so interconnected. So uh, I hope that uh, we would like to deepen uh, American friends' understanding of the importance of uh, our uh, close ties in terms of the uh, economic uh, partnership as well. And the third pillar is the cultural arena. And uh, you know, the, uh, I really wanted the American audience to deepen the understanding as, uh, uh, of Japan as a great friend, appreciating each other's culture and deepening mutual understanding through cultural exchanges. And, uh, you know, the, uh, this is a kind of a core of the, uh, our activity because in order to, uh, you know, tighten our important bilateral relations, people to people exchange or mutual understanding on the uh, you know people's uh, base you know, level is very a kind of a, uh, important and a substantial uh, uh, you know, substantial so uh, for example uh, in my case this is my personal experience but uh, uh, this is my actually a second tour uh, as a diplomat to a station in Washington DC and last time was almost like 12 years ago and at that time, I have two daughters, and the one, uh, you know, the uh, sen uh, elder daughter was only an elementary school student. And uh, she never understood English even as a word. As a word. And uh, thanks to the uh, American generous uh, education system, in which e so-called ESOL system provided to her, uh, you know, she can, you know, start learning English as a, you know, student uh, participate in that program in which you know, they provided us a basic understanding of English. And then we moved to India later, and even in India, she was so fascinated with the American education system, she entered the American school in New Delhi rather than attending the Japanese school. <laughs> and after all, she came back to Japan and spent five years in junior high and high school where she attended the uh, Japanese private school, but she never uh, gave up her dream to come back to the United States as a student. And luckily enough, this time she was accepted as a student in the, uh, 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 in the university in Philadelphia, and uh, she is now leading a very uh, uh, you know, enjoyable uh, school life. And even, you know, when she, uh, actually she was supposed to come back to the DC as a family reunion at the uh, Thanksgiving day, but uh, all she had to do is just, uh, she went to her you know, friend's house in Tennessee where she was invited. And uh, all she, ha she did it to me is just to send my, me uh, the uh, airfare bill <laughs> electronically. <laughs> I think that it was a good sign that uh, she is enjoying her life in the States you know, so much. And uh, I'm sure that in that, in, in that aspect, and she is doing a better job than myself as a you know, public diplomacy. <laughs> so uh, this is my experience, and uh, this is a cultural aspect. And in terms of uh, public diplomacy uh, towards Asia, uh, I think that uh, uh, I observe the kind of uh, increase of the awareness of uh, confidence, responsibility, and leadership, as well as diplomacy, rule of law, and the market economy uh, taking root 
in uh, Southeast, Southeast Asia and the South Asia uh, area. So I think, you know, as a partner sharing the common value, I think Japan and the United States can, you know, make a good collaboration in terms of public diplomacy towards Asian uh, countries. So this is my ob observation, but anyway, uh, I always uh, think highly of the uh, you know, bilateral collaboration with the United States as a partner and a good friends sharing the common value. So this is my uh, point. Thank you very much. I think we have just heard two somewhat differing approaches to uh, public diplomacy. And they, pr they provide, I think, a good um, starting point for our discussion. Because what I heard, uh, Ambassador Cooper, from you is that Australia emphasizes people to people in your public diplomacy strategy. Whereas, uh, Minister Shimada, I hear that Japan, uh, while you do have a cultural component in your public diplomacy strategy, the emphasis is really uh, on government-to-government uh, -government policy issues. Um, so I wonder whether we might discuss these contrasting approaches, which is more effective, and uh, can the two be, well, the two are obvious, it can be combined, but still there is a differing emphasis. So how do we, how do we uh, evaluate? What, what approach might be more useful, more successful, under what circumstances? Can I make a comment? Yes. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, uh, I don't know if we do have differing approaches or if it's more an issue of nomenclature, because certainly um, we have very active engagement uh, on government to government level and around the political and economic sphere. Um, and part of that is public diplomacy. For example, if we were holding a, a panel discussion on trade or on uh, values, uh, security, we would consider that to be public diplomacy. Um, uh, but when we generally use the term public diplomacy, we are thinking more of the activities that we do in that, um, not just cultural, but in that uh, public space. So. Um, our, when we talk about pub public diplomacy, it tends to be around those sorts of activities. And certainly people-to-people -people exchanges are, are a key element of that. But I, 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 wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think that there is a big difference between Japan and Australia in the way that we prosecute our agenda. Mm. Um, but different countries call public, call, you know, group their activities in different ways, which was, you know, part of my, um, part of the reason for my introductory uh, comments. Um, but that in itself is an interesting discussion, you know, how broad is public diplomacy and what is public diplomacy? Because at the end of the day, we're all uh, in the business, in dip not just diplomats, but each of us who represent our country overseas, in portraying the best of our country, trying to help the audience understand uh, who we are, what we stand for, what our values are, what we bring to the table, what we offer, um, and also, of course, to... Um, in, in, in many areas, and that's what we do as implement, seek to influence those we speak to. Whether, for example, it's about free and open trade and the value of that, whether it's about uh, uh, our desire for um, stability and security, prosperity, um, that's what uh, diplomacy is, is all about. It's about soft power. Minister Shimada. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador, and uh, I totally agree with the Ambassador, and uh, I, you know, basically we don't have any fundamental appro different approach uh, between the two countries. And uh, actually, the, uh, having engaged in the public diplomacy, the irony is that uh, once we have uh, some difficulties uh, with the uh, countries whom, uh, in which uh, I'm working for, like in the past, uh, maybe in 1980s and early 90s, when uh, Japanese uh, companies uh, exported the Japanese cards to the United States by ship, of course there are lots of frictions. And at that time, maybe the uh, uh, role of diplomacy at that time was that, uh, you know, uh, to emphasize the, uh, you know, the uh, importance of the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Japan as a kind of uh, country who are 
uh, who, which is also you know the uh, uh, sharing the common value and so forth. Just like uh, you know, Japan is also uh, you know believing in the uh, freedom, of, uh, you know, the uh, free market system, and so forth. But now that this is uh, you know completely shared value already, so uh, you know we don't have to worry about the trade friction, and we don't have to worry about any uh, you know friction in terms of the policy. So now that uh, Jap what we are doing or focusing on the on the uh, diplomacy is the uh, only cultural side because, of course, uh, a Japanese, you know, maybe only one part which we are not sharing with you know, Americans is language. And uh, in that sense, you know, uh, for example, we have been in introducing the uh, exchange program, so-called JET program, Japanese English teaching program, uh, in which uh, we invite a lot of Americans to uh, stay and uh, to come to uh, in, in, uh, to Japan for at least two years as uh, assistant English teachers, and uh, we provide the salaries and we provide the housing and uh, and through that not only uh, you know the uh, uh, having edu you know, education from such assistants but also we would ask them to experience Japanese culture and to uh, you know uh, exchange uh, cultural exchange to, to have ex cultural exchange with the local Japanese, because these jet, jet students are you know, located everywhere, everywhere in the world, uh, everywhere in, the, in Japan, even in the local city, where, uh, you know, where you know, uh, uh, local people never uh, have ex, you know, experience to see the foreigners. So in that sense, you know, uh, as we have already uh, shared lots of common values and we have, uh, you know, uh, our economy is so interconnected with the United States. So now that uh, naturally our focus, uh, focus or emphasis are more or less, uh, you know, put on the uh, cultural side. Maybe that is a kind of a difference we, you, you see. Yeah. Let me just probe you to a little bit further. Okay, granted, there's not much difference, let's say, between, uh, in, your, in, your, in the practice, uh, how you practice a public diplomacy. But I wonder, um, I heard another difference. In Japan, you said, is primarily focused in your public diplomacy efforts on the United States. Australia, on the other hand, has a much broader audience, or sometimes we call them targets, uh, they are the Indo-Pacific, the students and people in the Indo-Pacific. So, why the difference? And I guess the question is, why? Uh, you have suggested that your Japan's public diplomacy efforts are primarily aimed at the United States while Australia's public diplomacy efforts are aimed at the broad Indo-Pacific region. I, and I'm asking why. Uh, actually, as I, I'm a diplomat session here, so I, I just focusing on our activity of the public diplomacy towards Americans. <laughs> so, but but uh, if I be posted to, for example, India or Singapore, I would focusing on more bilateral you know, relation with just such a country. So uh, uh, I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, think about other countries. But uh, you know, as a diplomat situation here. I think from the Australian perspective, we very much align our public diplomacy with our strategic priorities, and they are set out quite clearly in the white paper. Um, so we are part of the Indo-Pacific region, so our um, efforts across the board, not just in public diplomacy, but in our... If you have a look at our diplomatic footprint, for example, you can see a heavy concentration in that part of the world. We consider Washington to be part of the Indo-Pacific, so Washington... So the US is, is captured in that broader Pacific. It's a member of APEC. That's our framework. Um, but if we looked at, for example, our budgets provided to our posts, um, that perhaps gives you a sense of our priorities. And the five um, countries where we have our largest public diplomacy budgets for our posts, this is just a small part of our budgets because a lot of them are done on a global scale. But you know, um, uh, China, Indonesia, India, Japan and the United States. So there's no real surprise there about where we're putting our efforts. It's our biggest uh, strategic and most important partners. But we have really active public diplomacy programs uh, across the globe. 
Well, Ambassador Cooper, you have mentioned the elephant that is not in this room, uh, or that is not here at this table, and that is China. So uh, let me ask one more question before I open it to the audience uh, for your questions and discussion. Um, there is no question that um, the Asia region does not want to choose. And that problem or that issue may not be avoidable because increasingly uh, China is now a competitor to the US in terms of differing governing models and global visions. So my question would be, how would public diplomacy play out on that question? How do you see it playing out in your country? I'm not asking for choices because you've both already said Australia and Japan are friends of the United States. We share values. But the Asia region is vast. And in fact, I would like those in the audience who have expertise, who represent other parts of the Asia region that is not represented here at the table to comment as well as to pose questions. There's no question that China has been really uh, giving higher priority, giving a lot more money. In the Economist article, it said 10 billion for just soft power or public diplomacy, not to mention the trillions that they're investing in I, One Belt, One Road, the AIIB, the infrastructure banks, this is using hard economic power to buttress soft power, public diplomacy. I would really be interested in your thinking, your thoughts, as well as the audience's thoughts. What role does public diplomacy have to play in this competition, in this struggle, and how will it play out? Ambassador Cooper, would you like to begin, or Minister Schmeider? Um, I think I would go back to my earlier comments about where we place our priority in terms of public diplomacy, and, and that is what is in, uh, uh, what values, what messages uh, is Australia trying to send through our public diplomacy program? And that goes back to our values, um, it goes back to our key objectives, and we have similar messages both to China and to the United States in terms of our public diplomacy program. Australia doesn't, Australia's priorities, goals, and strategic objectives are quite clear. They're clearly set out in our white paper, and the role of our public diplomacy program is to promote those wherever they may be. So that is how we approach uh, each of our countries with which we have public diplomacy programs. So I think the question they're posing really doesn't come into our public diplomacy efforts. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador, for raising such an important uh, point. And, you know, the uh, Japan is the uh, neighbor of the uh, so-called you know, big elephant or not, and China, South Korea, and others. And we have been, uh, you know, uh, nurturing a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, historical ties and uh, friendship with these countries. And now that, uh, you know, in terms of the public diplomacy, as I mentioned, the you know, most important part for us to, uh, you know, the pursue uh, public diplomacy is a kind of a core value which we can share with. And that's why uh, I, I, you know, we have been 
uh, you know, uh, keeping very good relations in terms of policy-wise, economy-wise, and cultural-wise with the United States. And from that point of view, unfortunately, maybe China is not, uh, you know, a partner like the United States for us, which shares you know, almost the same, you know, you know, common value. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, as our Prime Minister mentioned, you know, uh, China is not a challenge. Uh, you know, China, I know, who, which is uh, you know, increasing their power and developing uh, themselves as a responsible partner of the global community, that is kind of a welcome uh, post, uh, attitude. And uh, you know, as, as Japan, uh, as a good neighbor of China and a good, very good close friend of the United States, uh, our strategy is that uh, you know, uh, we would encourage China to become the very good partner of us to pursue the uh, common goal of the uh, prosperity and stability, not only the region, but also the uh, you know, global as a, as a, you know, global and world as a, as a whole. So uh, that's why uh, we encouraged uh, China to participate in the WTO, and uh, we encouraged the, uh, China to participate in the uh, uh, some you know, economic partnerships and uh, you know, uh, uh, framework and so forth. And also even the, uh, uh, we encouraged China to participate in our side to cope with the North Korean threat. So uh, that is the uh, kind of our uh, activity to engage China into the uh, you know uh, uh, good partner as a responsible uh, member of the international community. So from that part, uh, of course, uh, unfortunate that at this juncture uh, we cannot uh, you know uh, go with the public diplomacy uh, uh, with the uh, Chinese colleagues, but at the same time. Uh, maybe in collaboration with the United States and the like-minded countries to work on the China to uh, become the uh, uh, responsible t partner of the, uh, of the uh, uh, international community uh, to create a better world. That is uh, my understanding. Right. I'm going to open it up to the audience right now. But that, I have to stand up because I'm height challenged and I can't see most of you. So. Okay, all right. Um, I invite uh, any additional comments that the audience me uh, members may have to add to our discussion, uh, uh, certainly on the last question or uh, the both questions. Uh, if you have some comments now from uh, perhaps perspectives of other Asian, <clears throat> Asian nations <clears throat> that are not represented here, uh, I'd be happy to have them. C can you raise your hands? Anybody? Oh. <laughs> oh, introduce yourselves. Not everybody may know you, know you, and then make your remarks. Good morning, Alan Goodman at IIE. A, a technical question for both speakers. Uh, visa policies are extremely important in opening doors and allowing more international students uh, into your countries. Do you anticipate Japan and Australia having changes in its visa policies over the next few years that we should be prepared for? Australia has a, a pretty um, uh, uh, constant set of visa uh, requirements and have had for a long time. We require all countries to have a visa to enter into Australia and there's nothing that I'm aware of on the horizon that will lead to changes in that. Um, <clears throat> Um, in such a globalized world, uh, uh, our strategy remains the same as in, in terms of the cultural exchange, but uh, uh, we uh, tend to put an emphasis on the uh, encouragement to the uh, 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 younger generation, like a university student, to study abroad each other. And uh, now that the uh, Japanese government encouraged Japanese students to study abroad, especially in the United States, and uh, one of the challenges they face is the uh, uh, cost of the university. So we always uh, discuss what sort of uh, uh, measure we can take in collaboration with the uh, American counterparts. So uh, from that point of view, uh, you know, in order for us to send much more uh, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, students to the United States, maybe we should uh, uh, 
ask collaboration from the US side to uh, work on this point. I think Sher Sherry, you're, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sherry Mueller, American University. Wanted to ask a specific question about a specific program in each case. Um, Ambassador Cooper, if you would share a little bit, how do you measure the success of your special visits program and what is the scope of it? And then Minister Shimada, every time I enjoy the cherry blossoms, I'm always very grateful to Japan. How do you, can you tell us a little bit about the background of that brilliant public diplomacy move that was made long before we had the term public diplomacy and how you measure its success now? Thank you. I think that's a very good question about how you measure the success of any public diplomacy program because the metrics aren't always easy. Um, in terms of our special visitors program, it is very much um, an assessment made by each embassy as to who they will nominate. Uh, sometimes uh, the people who are invited out as special visitors do go on to become influential in their countries and sometimes they do not. Uh, so, um, uh, that for those who go on to be influential, obviously that's a very, um, you know, that, that's the ideal um, outcome from a special visits program. But even if, if, if people that we've invited do not go on to be the president or a minister or a congress representative or something of that ilk, uh, what we have achieved is a greater understanding of Australia, our values, what we represent. And uh, I think partly because Australia is so far away and si so isolated, the more often that we get visitors through Australia, the greater impact that we have on uh, understanding internationally of, of who we are and, and what, our, what, what our goals and values and strategic objectives are. So I think that we don't have, a, you know, we don't have an actual metric, but we have, um, we have assessed over the years that that's a really productive way of bringing people to Australia. It's very tailored. It's it's one-on-one, um, -on -one, essentially. The visitor comes, he or she brings their spouse. They have a dedicated liaison. They, uh, they uh, indicate what areas of interest they have. Some of it is uh, uh, government to government. Uh, some of it is, um, it can be uh, tourism. It can be the arts. It, it can be any element, really sport. So it's a really tailored program, and I think when you're able to tailor a program for a senior visitor, it has a really significant impact on, on, on them and stays very much in their mind. Uh, thank you very much for raising a question about the Cherry Blossom Festival. And uh, I, in terms of the diplomat stationing here, uh, Cherry Blossom Festival is one of the most uh, gracious sort of uh, uh, present from our predecessors, not only from Japanese, but also the Americans. The uh, origin of the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival started the uh, historical fact that the uh, mayor of Tokyo uh, give, uh, presented the uh, gift of a bunch of uh, uh, cherry trees to the uh, uh, Washington DC year 1912. So, uh, and uh, the uh, fascinating uh, historical anecdote is that uh, even uh, during the uh, Second World War, where we went through the uh, very uh, difficult times, uh, the, uh, the uh, American citizens here in Washington, D.C., uh, just uh, carefully uh, you know, take, took care of the trees. And then, now that uh, we enjoy such uh, full of rooms of the, not only the uh, cherry blossom itself, but the friendship of the two countries. So uh, uh, this is a really kind of a symbol of the uh, uh, US-Japan bilateral relations. So uh, that's why we always engage in this uh, program uh, as a kind of a you know, uh, supporter, but because this Cherry Blossom Festival is owned by American, Americans, not the Japanese government's uh, uh, program. So that is the most significant part. So uh, I, we always uh, support and engage in that program so that uh, more and more Americans deepen the understanding of the US-Japan US relations. And, uh, and also more and more Americans, especially younger generations, to pass around such a you know, history of a friendship to the uh, next generations. 
So in order to do so, uh, we always uh, uh, ask for the home government to send a good uh, you know, artist of the uh, uh, you know, modern uh, you know, the, uh, pop cultures and or even as the uh, uh, traditional dancers and so forth, so that uh, we, we could uh, deepen the uh, American audience understanding of the variety of Japanese culture. And also, uh, we hope that uh, they could uh, find a lot of uh, com you know, common values uh, among that. So uh, that is our activities and engagement. Thank you very much. Well, I see a hand here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rawan Yari, and I come from Lebanon. Um, well, I am an alumna of the IVLP and of the Humphrey Fellowship. Uh, I want to share something about the soft power and how it affected my community. I remember in 2005 when, if you are like uh, coming from uh, the USA in any kind of programs, it was such a um, thing that you wouldn't want to say or wouldn't want to tell in your community, especially if you're coming from the city I come from, it's a rural area, it's in Balbek. Uh, and how with the exchange programs, uh, we are able to uh, to break that kind of border and create bridges. Uh, now I am on the national board of the state alumni. I am the secretary of the national board and there is no more fear. We have chapters in our areas. We meet regularly and this is different. It is online, it is on our Facebook pages. Um, I just wanted to share this because um, it's been very, it's, it changed my life so dramatically in a very in a good way, and uh, now I am running through You Speak organization, uh, two of the nation of the nationwide programs, the um, Teaching Women English program and uh, the Spelling Bee program. Um, well accepted, no problems. It is soft power. So I want to say again, thank you, for, for first for the invitation and for all the efforts that has been made on public diplomacy programs. And thank you again for everyone who's, who participated in that. Thank you. Would you like a comment? Well, thank you for, for that comment. Uh, you know, looking at the time, why don't I take a few questions and then let's tr uh, try to get everybody. Uh, did I see a hand over, uh, over here? And then, was there another hand over there? No? Okay. Oh, over there. All right. One and then two. Go ahead. Good morning. I'm Patricia Harrison, Director of Professional Exchanges at World Learning. And perhaps to follow on that comment, um, in the U.S., uh, justification for professional, uh, for um, public diplomacy programs has begun shifting from talk of mutual understanding to more national security issues. And as an American, I, I have mixed feelings about that shift. Um, I'd be interested to hear your comments about whether you agree on that as justification for public diplomacy, and also um, what um, perhaps limitations that that may also have for our work in this field. That's a very important question. Sir, why don't you answer your question too, then we'll answer it together. Thank you. If I understood correctly, you have been a, a high school exchange student at the time, same as me. And uh, I would like to ask, you know, in, in, in the specific case of Australia, with your efforts of people-to-people -people diplomacy, how that plays vis-a-vis -vis restrictions that exist, as I understand it, at the state level on reciprocity between students from Australia going abroad and foreign students going into Australia. Um, because we see that in, in other countries, that sometimes national um, efforts, you know, to, to increase or strengthen people-to-people -people, uh, strategies are restricted either by local governments or even schools that are becoming in some countries more and more restrictive to accept foreign students or allowing their own students to go abroad. So if you have any 
any comments about that. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Cooper, why don't you answer that question first, and then we'll move on to the, to the first question. Um, I'm not aware of any restrictions. It sounds like you may be aware of, of some. Uh, I'm not sure if you're asking a question around uh, uh, recognition of uh, education courses or whether you're talking about restrictions in terms of numbers or movements. It sounds it sounds like a state uh, a state to state issue or a community community issue. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry I can't add any shed any light, but I'm very happy to discuss that offline with you. Uh, and now the question about your thoughts on um, or, or rather, uh, what you think of the um, increasing tendency to use public diplomacy to advance national security interests and issues. Uh, is this good, bad, indifferent? Well, uh, thank you very much for inter and such a you know, very important question. And the, uh, my understanding as a diplomat is that uh, diplomacy is a kind of art to deal with the nation-to-nation uh, -nation relations uh, for the sake of pursuing the uh, national interest, just like a definition of the uh, uh, State Department. Uh, but, uh, you know, in order for the uh, nation national states to realize the uh, uh, national interest, of course, you know, we have to deal with the, uh, such uh, security issues and economic issues. But at the same time, this is as a matter of fact, but at the same time, uh, in order for us to realize such an uh, interest, a role of public diplomacy is uh, becoming more and more in important. Because, you know, the, uh, now is the time of the uh, not, uh, you know, hot war, and, uh, you know, it's not, not time for the uh, nations to uh, realize the interest, or, you know, uh, through the uh, warfare. And this is a time of the uh, international uh, in, uh, information technology uh, in which, the in, you know, information is going through the world, you know, in a minute or so, in a second or so. So from that point of view, the uh, public image is very important, you know, very, you know even interconnected to the uh, public image of the one country is interconnected to the uh, pursuit of the uh, realization of the uh, uh, security issues or even economic issues. So that's why the uh, public diplomacy is very important nowadays. So, uh, of course, we cannot say the uh, you know security issue and uh, diplomacy to deal with the security issue and the public diplomacy. We cannot you know uh, judge which is uh, you know important, the other and it's not less important. Uh, it is kind of uh, you know the both uh, you know size of the uh, wheels. So, uh, but now that I got the impression that the role of public diplomacy is more and more important in this world. So uh, I don't know whether. Uh, I answer your, you know, answer your question uh, you know, squarely or not, but uh, that is my impression. Ambassador Cooper? Uh, I, I agree with, um, with the comment of, of my friend from Japan. Um, when we as professionals look at uh, what we do, what is diplomacy and public diplomacy being part of that broader suite of tools, if you like, we look at very much as uh, through the national interest prism. That sounds rather hard-headed, but once you start to unpack that, you find that, in fact, mutual understanding and protecting your national security are all subsets of what it is to protect the national interest. Mm -hmm. So if we want to you know, do it in a very big-picture strategic way, what are Australia's national interests? Well, we, we want... Uh, we want a, a region and a world that is secure and safe. We want a region and a world that is prosperous. Uh, we want a region and a world where we have free exchange of goods and ideas, where people's fundamental values are respected and understood. We want a good uh, understanding and commitment to the rule of law in our region and across the world so we all understand what the rules of the road are so that potential for conflict 
uh, and miscalculation is reduced. Um, I would venture to suggest that uh, during periods of, uh, of greater harmony, uh, there is more of a swing towards uh, language around mutual understanding and um, cultural exchange and so on. And when we are seeing more uncertain times, there's a more of a shift in the language uh, towards, uh, uh, depending what, what is going on, national security or, or liberal trade. To me, there are both sides of the same coin. But I think it is fair to say that we are currently in a fairly uneasy period of history. Um, we are seeing very significant shifts in geostrategic power. Uh, we are seeing that particularly in the Indo-Pacific. Um, that's no secret and no surprise. To some extent, that is about history and demographics. Um, we have also experienced very frightening uh, times in recent years with the rise of non-state actors and terrorism. And in particular, we've seen uh, some, some very um, uh, worrying and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, hideous uh, actions by ISIS and others in various parts of the world. So I don't think it's a surprise to anybody in this room that we are in a period of uncertainty uh, and a period of greater contest. So it's not surprising to me then that countries start to talk a little bit more about national security and that that becomes then a prism through which they view broader programs. So I, I don't see that as a, as a worrying. I see that simply as a reflection. I'm not commenting here specifically on the United States um, for programs, but as a general as a general comment, it's not surprising to me then that we see shifts in language across programs. I think it's um, it's a, it's a reflection of the times. With these two very excellent responses, I still would like to add a comment. Uh, from my experience in government, which is quite old, but some things just don't change. I think this is in part in response to the declining budgets, the, the America's declining resources, uh, in the competition for funds within our government system, international education exchange does not do well, has never done well, even in its highest points. Um, and here I think is time for me to share with you Professor Sherry Muller's graphic. She did it in 2008. Her student is now someone who works in my office, and he brought this to my attention. And Sherry, if I, did this wrong, I do this wrong, please correct me. I don't know whether you can see this. What does it say? The very, very big, 723.1 billion. That is the Defense Department's budget. Today, it's about 700 billion, 2018. This figure that you cannot even see, it's uh, 36.5 billion. It's small and is kind of fuzzy. But that is, what do you think is the budget, uh, that, that's the budget for? State Department? It's the International Affairs budget. Then I couldn't, my eyesight is very bad. I could not see this. Do you see something else on this graph? Do you see anything? Do you see anything at all? Those young people here? with very clear eyes, eyesight. There's a little, little, little tiny dot. I couldn't see it on my screen even, even this close up. What do you think that dot represents? What do you think? The dot represents the budget for international education and exchange. So just looking at this graph, there's an answer to your question, Ms. Harrison. Those of us in this room, 
would like to see this little dot become at least fuzzy, but visible. So you take on using public diplomacy as a tool for advancing the national security interests as well as national interests in order to be able to make at least some kind of a case when you appear before uh, OMB and say that under 600 million, I think it is the international education exchange budget now, it's 500 and some million, is not enough. However, those of us here need to make a better case for why it matters, why public diplomacy matters. And also, we've talked a lot about promoting mutual understanding. That has come up again and again and again. So the question that we also have to answer is, so what? So what? if another 100,000 students better understand America, or Australia, or Japan. What does it matter, and what does it mean? So I think our time is up. So for the next speaker, senator, uh, another senator.